could have just kept on singing and let the power of God come, but I know the word is important, and I know that we're here for that. But I'm thankful. I know the Willoughbys, we kind of just disappeared this week. Um, we're kind of low maintenance. We've traveled so much that we don't really have to be catered to a lot, but we've just enjoyed the week with it being our anniversary. Our children were at camp in a way, so we were able to really relax and enjoy our time. So we just took it as a kind of a vacation also. So it's been a very enjoyable time, and you all have blessed me. Your energy um, have just really uh, made me want to go home and make everybody come to the front when we start worshiping. So... uh, Thank you for your thank you for your worship. Your heartfelt worship to him is very evident. And please don't keep it within these four walls. He didn't save you just for you to enjoy, but he saved you to go out and bring someone else in. So please use what you've received this week to go out and to bring others in. God bless you. Amen. Well, tonight is the last night and I'm going to talk about understanding God's Word. I think maybe you received notes on this um, and called Interpreting God's Word. And uh, over the past few nights we've talked about the oneness of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the life of holiness, principles of holiness. But tonight I want to talk to you more generally about how we can read and understand the Bible because uh, we face challenges and people wanting to know, well, why should we believe the Bible? And, well, that is your interpretation, but our interpretation is different. So how can you know what is the proper interpretation of the Bible? Now, I, I wrote a book called God's Infallible Word, and some of, some of this material is taken from the last chapter of that, I'm writing another book called Understanding God's Word, which is going to go into more depth. I hope to have it published in September, but it will go in more depth than some of these things we're talking about. But let me just give you a background. If we believe in God, we should believe in the Word of God. Uh, If God created us to have fellowship with Him, then there's, he has to have some way to communicate to us. And historically, the best means of communication is the written word. The written word is the most precise. Um, you, God can speak to an individual, but that individual speaks to another person, and that person speaks to another person, and before long, you don't know what the original word was. But the most effective means of communication throughout human history has been the written word. So it's best for precision, for preservation, and for propagation, that is, distribution to others. And so if we believe that God created us to have fellowship with us, then we should expect God would communicate with us. And we would expect that he would communicate with us through the written word. And that is exactly what the Bible is. It's the written word of God. Let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Excuse me, chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now I would like to read verse 15 through verse 17. The notes that I have here are just a very brief outline of all the things that I would like to cover. So we'll see how far we get tonight. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy and said, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You'll notice the scripture will lead us to salvation, and the scripture will give us everything we need for proper teaching. And if you want to look at it in the positive and the negative, in the sense of teaching us the things we should do, but also correcting us when we're wrong. And then it will give us everything we need to be perfect or mature 
thoroughly equipped for all good works. So the Bible, the Word of God, the Scriptures, have everything we need to lead us to salvation and everything we need to teach us in the Christian life and everything we need to do the work of ministry in the work of God. So it doesn't mean we shouldn't study other things, but it means that the Bible is our authority for all of these areas. It's our authority for salvation. It's our authority for Christian living. And notice in verse 16, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration. That from the Greek word literally means God breathed. So the Bible is the very breath of God breathed out to us. And we should accept the Bible as God's very word. Now, it was inspired by God and written by humans. It's a divine human work. You, when we, we study the Bible, the different authors, we can see their different styles, different vocabulary, different background, different experiences. Uh, so God chose writers who would effectively communicate his purpose. He chose them from various backgrounds. And so they would express the truth in different ways. It's not all, it doesn't all sound the same. The message is consistent, but the method of presentation varies. But God kept his hand on the whole process so that the end result would be true and accurate. So one writer may have used certain words based on his own culture and his own background and experience. Another writer may have used different words based on his own background and experience. But God kept his hand on the whole process so that both writers are communicating the truth of God's word, that every word is true. And so with that understanding, we approach the Bible. And I want to talk about how, what is the right way to interpret it. Now, in our day, we live in what is called a postmodern generation. And the idea in this postmodern world is everybody has their own interpretation. And whatever you think is right is right. But that's not the way God has established truth. Truth is not subject to different people's interpretation or opinion. Truth is absolute. Truth is based in the reality of God. And so the Word of God, we, we don't have the right to twist it to suit our own purposes. If we uh, can just approach it the way any way we want to, then how can it correct us? We become the judge of the Bible in that case. But instead, the Bible needs to be the judge of us. The Bible corrects us. Now, everybody approaches the Bible with some kind of understanding. And everybody reads the Bible with some principles of interpretation in your mind. Even if you don't realize it, you have some background by which you approach the Bible. We cannot avoid that. We all come with our own thoughts and our own background. But what we try to do is come to the Word of God and let it speak to us and correct our thoughts. And it's a process of going round and round some say in a circle, but I would like to say a spiral because I think we get closer and closer and closer to an accurate understanding. But we start with what we know and we read the Bible and try to understand it, but listen to what it says so that it corrects our thoughts. So then we come back to the Bible and read it again with revised thoughts to see if our new understanding fits more accurately. So we read it again and we learn some more. Even though we've studied it many times, it will say something fresh to us again. Have you ever had that experience? And so it's a process whereby we continue to increase our understanding and mold, let the Bible mold our thinking so that eventually we hope that the way we understand the world and the way we understand truth and the way we read the Bible fits very closely with the way that God intended for us to understand truth. So... If we pretend that I'm just an unbiased person, I'm just neutral, I come to the Bible with a perfect neutrality, well, that's not true. You come to the Bible with your own biases, your own traditions. But as much as possible, you try to listen to what the Bible is saying to you and correct your understanding. We had a question the other night about uh, why is it so difficult for people to see the oneness of God. And I think one reason is they come with their own 
uh, presuppositions or biases, and there are certain areas they're not willing to listen to. They're not willing to be open because they think it's so important or so traditional, and so everything they read is filtered through those lens lenses or it's filtered through the understanding they already have. But we've got to be willing to set aside our tradition and let the Bible teach us. Now, let me give you ten principles of interpretation. And if we can keep these points in mind, they will help us to understand the Bible. And I believe we can actually find uh, these ten principles in the Bible itself. It comes from the very nature of God's Word. So let me talk about them. Now, now what's the value of this study tonight? Well, first of all, it will help us be more accurate and more consistent in understanding the Bible. Second, when we come in dialogue with people of other beliefs, sometimes we'll get to the same scripture and they will say, I think it means this, and we will say, I think it means that. Well, how can you know who's right and who's wrong? So you appeal to some principles and say, well, now, you, would you agree this is the proper way to interpret Scripture? And if you can agree on this, then let's apply this method to the Bible and to this passage, and let's see what we find. And so it helps us sometimes when there's a disagreement over doctrine that you cannot seem to re reconcile if you step back and say, well, how are you reading the Bible? How are you studying the Bible? Let's start with that. And sometimes you can help the person to, to step back from that particular passage or step back from that particular doctrinal position that they hold and think more seriously and more uh, freely about uh, how they are reading the Bible. And so sometimes you're able to help them in that way. So the ten principles of interpretation. The first one says that we should use the grammatical historical method. Now that sounds like a big word, but let me explain it to you and then I think it will make sense. When we read the Bible, we read it in its grammatical context and its historical contact, context. Now, when I say the grammatical context, I mean how the words are put together in sentences, the meanings of the words, just as you would read um, a newspaper or just as you would read a textbook. Now, of course, the Bible is unique and special, but what I'm saying is when God inspired the written word, the message is unique, but the method is not unique. In other words, God chose to use human language, and He is using human language in the same way that we use human language, to communicate the author's ideas. And so we need to follow the grammatical context, understand the words in the same way that uh, you would, in the ordinary way that you would understand words. In other words, there's not a special code to interpreting the Bible. There's not a secret meaning uh, underneath the words. But you read the words for their ordinary, apparent, uh, normal meaning. You look at the definitions of the words and their relationships to each other and how they're put together in the sentence. That's the grammatical context. You also look at the historical context. You must understand the Bible in the way that it was written at the time. In other words, it's not the modern definition of words, but the words that were chosen when the Bible was written. You have to understand the, the, the culture of the time in order to understand uh, what a certain sentence means in the Bible. You cannot simply come from the 21st century Singaporean experience. You've got to go back to the first century experience and understand if you're going to understand a parable of Jesus about fishing or about farming. You cannot take our methods of fishing or farming. You have to go back and study the first century methods of fishing and farming. If you're going to read a certain word in the Bible, you cannot take our modern definition. You have to go back and take the ancient definition. So that's the historical context. Now, basically, there are two choices in interpreting the Bible. You can use the method I've just described. Sometimes it's called the literal method because you're trying to take uh, the, the words literally, the way that they're written, the way you would take ordinary words. Um, but I don't use... I. Ch chose not to use that term literal because sometimes that might be confusing to people Some because the Bible does contain things like figures of speech and, and so forth. Uh, 
And we're not denying that the Bible would have figures of speech, parables, symbols, and types. But we're simply saying that we must look at the author's intention. You know, in our modern speech, we use um, symbols and figures of speech. But the key is what is the intention of the author? Did he intend for this to be a poetic speech or uh, a very literal speech? Did he intend for it to be a figure of speech or did he intend for it to be very little, literal? For example, if I tell you uh, today, um, I've told you a thousand times to close the door when you come inside. Now, what do I mean when I say that? Do I mean I've counted the number of times it's equal to exactly 1,000? And so you could raise your hand and say, Brother Bernard, no, you've only said that 997 times, so you're lying. When I say, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I said the wrong thing. No, that's not what I mean. I'm not talking about counting the number of times. I'm using a deliberate exaggeration to emphasize a point. What my meaning is, I've told you this so many times, I shouldn't have to tell you again. That's my meaning. And you understand that's my meaning. So I'm using a figure of speech deliberately. But that's what I intended. That's what you understand. And so the communication has been effective. So that's a grammatical, historical interpretation. You're getting at the meaning of the words the way I intended them. The same way with the Bible. If the Bible uses a figure of speech, if the author intends a figure of speech, we interpret it as such. But we're bound by the understanding of the text the way it was written, the intention of the author. But so when we study the Bible, we basically have one of two choices. We can use this grammatical historical method that I've just described, or we can use what's called the allegorical method. The allegorical method means that you find hidden meanings behind the surface meaning. And you interpret it according to various doctrinal um, positions. You're actually putting the meaning into the text. And what I'm saying tonight, that's not the correct way to interpret Scripture. If you use that approach, this Bible can mean anything you want it to mean. Because you're basing your interpretation on your doctrine. And so how can the Bible instruct you? You're putting your doctrine into the text. How can the Bible correct you? You're the one that's putting the doctrine into the text. Let me give you an example. This was a very prominent method in the early writings of people that's known as the church fathers. And that's one of the problems with the doctrines that have been changed over the years is they use this allegorical method which allows you to find any doctrine you want to find in the scripture. Perhaps you've heard of Augustine or Augustine is a very prominent writer uh, in the 400s. Well, I'll give you an example. The story in John chapter 21, the gospel of John chapter 21, where um, the Jesus told the disciples to cast their nets on the other side of the boat and they caught a great catch of fish and the total was 153. Remember that story? Well, Augustine said 153. That's an interesting number. In fact, if you've got a little calculator, you can do this. If you take 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, etc., all the way up to 17, the sum total is 153. So, he said, there must be something significant about the number 17. Well, if you take the number 10 plus 7, you get 17. Well, 10 is the number of the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. And 7 is the seven spirits of God in the book of Revelation, signifying the fullness of the New Testament. So he says the purpose of this 153 fish is to show that God is combining the Old Testament and the New Testament together. Well, that's an allegorical interpretation. Because you, you cannot find that just by reading the text. You have, you're bringing your doctrine to the text. Now, I've heard some people say, well, there, there were 153 nations in the world, and so each fish represents one nation, so the gospel is going to be preached to all the nations. Well, now, you might find another scripture that says it's God's will to preach the gospel to every nation, but that's not what that text says. Now, a grammatical historical interpretation would say, well, there had to be some number. You know, it, it, it's a historical account. It's a true story. Why would that number be recorded? Well, for one, it's showing you the large number. It shows the nature of the miracles, a true miracle. Because so many fish were caught. 
so quickly. Also, it shows there must have been an eyewitness. Somebody must have counted the fish. So that increases the truthfulness or your belie the believability of the story because it's obvious this story was told by somebody who was there and who counted the fish. So there is a reason for that number. But the reason is going to be found in the text itself. You cannot just pull a reason out of thin air. You have to have some justification in that text or at least maybe some other passage that would shed light on that text. Another example is the Catholic writer Jerome. You know the story of the parable of the sower and the, the, the four types of ground in Matthew 18. And the good ground produced a 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. So Jerome said there are three types of Christians. The 30-fold people are those who are married. The 60-fold people are those who are widowed. And the 100-fold people are those who never marry. What he was saying is being celibate is the best of all. Well, that's not found in that parable. That parable is not even talking about that. That is a Catholic doctrine put into the text to try to say that the more holy you are, then if you're really holy, you will not get married, but you will be like a priest or a nun. But that's not what Jesus was giving that parable for. That's something added to the text. So you see the allegorical interpretation can result in any doctrine that you want. And there are strange coincidences, and, and, and you, can, you can magnify those. In fact, do you have a King James Version of the Bible? I'll show you something really interesting. If you go to Psalm 46, now this takes a little while, so I don't know if you want to do this while I'm talking or not, but if you start at Psalm 46 and you start counting each letter from the beginning of the psalm and you get to the 46th word, not letter, I'm sorry, word, if you get to the 46th word, who wants to, who wants to find it for me? And while you're doing that, I want somebody else to start at the end and count backwards 46 words. But don't count sila because that's a, a written uh, punctuation. Um, so if you, somebody, who's counting from the front 46 words, okay? Do you have it? What is it? Shake. Okay, who's counting backwards 46 words? Anybody have it? Spear. Shake. Spear. Now, just wait. Psalm 46. You're counting 46 forward, 46 backward. This was published, the King James Version was published in 1611. And William Shakespeare was alive at that time. Guess how, how old he was? 46. Now, what is the spiritual meaning of that? These things happen. Somebody could start a doctrine on that, I think. Okay, so what I'm saying, that's not the right way to interpret Scripture. You don't go looking for hidden codes. You look for the plain, ordinary, everyday meaning by studying the gram grammatical context and the historical context. Okay, number two. The illumination of the Spirit is necessary. Now, I said that you can study the Scriptures just like an ordinary book. That's true to a point. And I think even a sinner, even an atheist, can read the Bible, study it carefully, and understand what it's saying. However, spiritual understanding goes beyond the mere understanding of words. You have to apply it to your life. And to do that, you need the work of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 tells us the carnal mind cannot understand the things of God because they are spiritually discerned. Now, if some, someone is sitting here today who is an atheist, they can understand every word I'm saying. And I can explain you need to repent of your sins. And you need to receive the Holy Spirit. And I can explain repentance. I can explain the Holy Spirit. They can understand it. But as far as actually being able to repent, actually being able to receive the Holy Spirit, they need the work of God. So the carnal mind cannot properly um, understand and apply God's Word without the work of God's Spirit. 
So that means we cannot simply study the Bible like a textbook. We start by understanding its words and studying the grammar, studying the history, and so on. But we have to mix our study with prayer and say, God, open my understanding so I know what you're trying to tell me. How does this apply to my life? How does this fit together? How can this change me? Without the power of God working in your life, you, this, the Word of God cannot really have its effect the way God intended. So, if we're going to study the Scripture, we have to have the illumination of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Bible is inspired by God. His Spirit moved upon holy men of old, and they wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Second Peter 1.21 tells us that. And so, if we want to understand the Word of God, uh, we need to ask that same Spirit of God to work in our lives to receive what was written. You know, if uh, some of you don't understand something that I'm teaching or maybe you've got one of my books and you can't, you don't understand what it says, you can come to me tonight and you can say, Brother Bernard, what did you mean by writing that on that page there? I don't understand it. Then I can explain it to you. Well, with the Bible, we can't go to Moses or Matthew or Paul but we can go to God and say, Lord, I don't understand this. Open my understanding that I can know what you're trying to tell me. Now, praying like that is not a substitute for study. You, you can't take a shortcut saying, well, I don't want to study. I just want God to reveal it to me. No, that's a way to get into the allegorical method where you're coming up with your own ideas. But you do your best to study but recognizing that your study is not enough. You must also have the illumination of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit must shine a light on the pages of the Bible and shine a light on your mind so that you can understand. Have you ever had that experience before you received the Holy Spirit? You were struggling to understand some things, but after you received the Holy Spirit, the Bible becomes a living book to you, and you open it, and it is as though God is speaking directly to you. Well, that's the illumination of the Spirit. So it doesn't replace the need for study, but it's necessary for a spiritual understanding. All right. Uh, number three, the Scriptures are basically clear and meant to be understood. God intends for us to understand His Word. If He gave it, go back to the purposes of Scripture that I read to you from uh, 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. The purpose is to lead us to salvation. The purpose is to instruct us, to correct us, to give us everything we need so in, in our Christian life. Well, for that purpose to be fulfilled, we have to understand it. And so we realize that God gave us the Bible in order for us to understand. It's not meant to be very difficult for us. Now, there are some passages that are difficult. And if you ever uh, go into something that you don't understand, don't despair. Even the Apostle Peter had a hard time understanding some scripture. He said in 2 Peter 3, 15 through 16, some of Paul's writings are hard to understand. So if you've ever had trouble understanding Romans or 1 Corinthians, where well, you're in good company, even the Apostle Peter had a hard time. So I'm not saying that everything in the Bible is easy to understand. But I'm saying overall, the message of Scripture is easy to understand. God has not hidden key doctrines in very obscure passages so that you have to become an expert, that you have to become, get a doctorate in theology before you can understand it. The whole Protestant Reformation was based on this principle that I'm talking about. In the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church put the Bible on the list of forbidden books the average person was forbidden to read the Bible. You know why? They said it will confuse them. They will not understand why we do certain things. Because when they read the Bible, it's going to seem contradictory. So they said only the priests can read the Bible. Only the experts can explain it. And for the common people, you just accept what they tell you. They tell you this is the interpretation of Scripture. You just accept it. You can't not understand it for yourself. But Martin Luther came along and said, no, God wants 
everyone to study the Word. And so he insisted on translating the Bible from Latin into German. But before that time, uh, the, generally the Bible was not even available in the language of the common people. But from that time on, the Bible was translated into various languages uh, so that the average person could read it for themselves and say, is this true or is this not? It, what, uh, is what our church teaching true or not? Does it match what the Bible says or not? So the entire Protestant Reformation was based on this concept. God intends for you to understand the Bible. Now, when we do find difficult passages, it's usually due to one of two reasons. Number one, it's due to our distance from the original context. In other words, the Bible it was clear to the people that it was originally written to, but since we live in a totally different situation, we have to do some extra study to get back to the original meaning. And that's, that corresponds to point number one. And the second reason why some things are difficult to understand is the lack of spiritual illumination. And that goes back to point number two. So I think those passages that are difficult, if we'll go back to points number one and two, do some hard work of study and do some praying for God to help us understand, then we can understand God's Word. Now, I would also say, and I'm going to point this out a little bit later, that one of the best ways to understand a difficult passage of Scripture is to look at the total context. I gave you some examples last night. And to look at other passages of Scripture on the same subject. And then it will become clear to you. Number four, the Bible is adapted to the human mind. The Bible is adapted to the human mind. God said in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and verse 9, my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. As high is, is, as the heaven is above the earth, that's how high my thoughts are above your thoughts. Now, if you just stop there, it might seem impossible for us to understand the things of God. But Isaiah 55, verse 10 through 11 goes on to say, But I've sent my word out. And my word will not return unto me void. Just as rain and snow fall from the heavens and water the earth and the earth brings forth fruit, so my word goes forth and it will not return void, but it will accomplish the purpose for which I sent it. So even though God's thoughts are much higher than ours, and we can never hope to understand all of the mind of God, God has given us his word so that we can understand important things about God. But what I'm trying to emphasize right now is the Bible is truth, but the Bible does not exhaust the truth. There's much more that we cannot comprehend because our minds are so small and God's mind, mind is so big. So God has to communicate to us in terms that we can understand. But that does not mean the truth is limited just to what we can understand. The truth is greater than what we can understand. I used some illustrations the other night when the Bible says, heaven is, God said uh, in the Bible, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Well, we understand it's not to mock God as a giant human being sitting there with his feet propped up on, on the North Pole. It's trying to describe the... Um, Om omnipresence of God. He's everywhere present. The power of God, the omnipotence of God. He's all powerful. How can we describe God being everywhere? That's too big for our minds to understand. How can we describe God as being all powerful? That's too big for our minds to understand. So God has to use some terminology that we can relate to. But don't limit God to that terminology. God is bigger than that. When the Bible speaks of God as being a jealous God, don't think of jealousy in our sense where it would be associated with, um, with maybe sinful attitudes, but think of a holy jealousy. It's trying to describe the thoughts of God in terms that we can understand, but don't limit the infinite God just to the terms that we can understand. Here's another example. The Bible talks about sunrise and sunset, but now... We know the sun doesn't literally go up and down in the sky. But instead, 
the earth is rotating around. So would we say the Bible is lying? The Bible doesn't know proper science? The, no. The Bible is using terms of our experience. And we do that today in our ordinary speech. We'll say, I saw the, the sunrise today. If somebody can say, oh, you're a liar. Don't you know physics? Don't you know uh, geology? Don't you know astronomy? You mean you, don't, you think the sun goes up and down in the atmosphere of the earth? How ridiculous are you? No, that's just, we're, we're just using everyday speech to describe the way it appears. We know the reality of science is different than the way it appears. But we're simply using a convenient form of speech to communicate. Well, the Bible does the same. But don't limit the Bible's speech just to our understanding. Maybe I can give you another example. What's heaven like? Does anybody know what heaven is really like? How can we describe what heaven is going to be like? Now, there are some descriptions of the New Jerusalem. It talks about the streets are of pure gold, as transparent as glass. What's the significance of that? I've thought about that. The Bible says in heaven the streets are of gold. But do we really care about the streets of heaven? I don't really care about the streets of heaven. Do you? But here's the, here's the significance. You know, the streets are the lowest form of existence. If somebody's sleeping on the streets, that's a pretty sad life. Somebody's living on the streets, that's pretty bad. On the streets, you find dirt. And on the streets, uh, you find common materials, um, rocks and concrete and asphalt. That's ordinary, everyday, common, dirty materials. But in heaven, the streets are of gold. Uh, what I think that is trying to tell us, the insignificant things about heaven are greater than the greatest things we have here. So just to describe the least of heaven, we have to use uh, the most valuable things in our vocabulary. So what's the good part of heaven? What's the wonderful part of heaven? We can't even describe it. Because just to describe the streets, we have exhausted our human thinking and our human vocabulary. So what I'm saying is, heaven is greater than the description in the Bible. Don't limit heaven by that description. You know, people say, oh, I, I want to see the streets of gold. Oh, I want to see the gates of pearl. Oh, well, yes, but after a few million years, it, that won't be important to you. You know, just to limit heaven by that description is making it much smaller than it really is. Heaven is much greater than that. You see? So the Bible has been written in terms that we can comprehend. So when the Bible says that the streets are of gold, we say, wow, it really must be great. And that's what the Bible is saying. But that's not all there is to heaven. There's a lot more to heaven than that. But the Bible can't really describe it to us. Because our minds are not big enough to understand it. Okay, number five. God reveals truth progressively from the Old Testament to the New Testament. When human beings fell into sin, we destroyed God's plan. And so God has, ever since that time, has been trying to lead us back into a full understanding of his purpose, step by step. He couldn't do it all at once. He had to train us, the human race. And uh, we see some examples of this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 through 25. The law was a schoolmaster or a tutor to bring us to Christ. But after we've come to Christ, we no longer need that, that schoolmaster. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 through 17 says that let no one judge you in things such as uh, food or drink or Sabbath days and so on because that is the shadow, the foreshadowing, but the reality is in Christ. These things were types and shadows that pointed to greater truth. It's, it's like if you're standing at a building and somebody's coming around the corner and before they get there you see their shadow. Cast. And so you can tell somebody's getting, coming around the corner. And maybe you look at the shadow and where the sun is and you can see, is it a tall person or a short person or skinny person or a fat person? 
But you can't really tell what they look like. You cannot tell who they are. You only get a vague understanding, a general idea. But when the person comes around the corner, you can see their face and you can know who they are. So you don't keep looking at the shadow. Now, who is that? Who is that? You look at the person right there. Okay? So in the Old Testament, we see the animal sacrifices. They teach us a lot of things. They teach us that, that all of us have sinned, that sin uh, requires a penalty, that the wages of sin is death. We need a sacrifice for our sins. We need a Savior. We need to have faith in God's plan and obey His plan. So those sacrifices were pointing to Calvary. They were pointing to Christ. But they didn't actually tell us who Christ was. They were getting us ready, preparing us. Well, now that Christ has come and we know about His death, burial, and resurrection, there's no need to keep practicing the animal sacrifices. That would be like looking at the shadow when the person is already there. So we need to forget about the shadows and look to Jesus. So the Old Testament had a purpose to bring us to Christ, and it still has a purpose of teaching us. But we find greater truth in the New Testament. So... On, on various subjects of Christian living, if you want to understand the fullness of God's plan, you don't just look at the Old Testament. You start with the Old Testament, but you follow the teaching through the New Testament till you'll see God's plan revealed. A good example would be marriage. In the Old Testament, Moses allowed divorce because of the hardness of people's hearts. Because people were divorcing, he was trying to regulate that and protect the rights of of particularly of the women involved in that situation. So when it comes to the New Testament, the, uh, the Jewish leaders challenge Jesus. They say, you know, we have different opinions as to when it's right to get a divorce. What do you say, Jesus? Can we get a divorce for any reason or does there have to be certain reasons? And Jesus refused to answer the question that in those terms because they are asking, when can I get a divorce? And he was saying, you're asking the wrong question. Go back to the creation in Genesis before sin. When God created one man, one woman, and they were designed for each other, and he said they were, they were to, to be joined to each other. He said God's purpose was to make the marriage successful. So don't ask, how can I get a divorce? Ask, how can I stay married? You know, you, you, you need to go back to God's original purpose. So if you just took one passage from the Old Testament about divorce, you might say, oh, well, uh, it's okay to get a divorce, so when can we get one? But if you follow the teaching all the way through from the creation, and then you see man's fall, you see the Old Testament teaching, and then you come to the teaching of Jesus, you find that God wants you to find a way to save your marriage if possible. And we know sometimes sin makes that impossible. But in that case, it's not... It's not because God wanted the divorce. It's because of human sinfulness. So to understand teachings on divorce, we had some questions last night on drinking alcoholic beverages. You have to read the Old Testament, but you also have to read what the New Testament says. You have to follow it all through because God is revealing truth progressively from the Old Testament to the New Testament. All right, number six. Scripture interprets Scripture. Scripture interprets Scripture. In Psalm 19, verse 7, we find a statement. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The law of the Lord is perfect. It's complete. It has everything we need. So if there's some passage of Scripture that's difficult to understand, we should study it. We should pray. But realize the Bible has the answer. So before using someone else to try to tell you what that means, let Scripture tell you what Scripture means. The whole of Scripture is the best context for understanding any particular part of Scripture. One passage will help you understand another passage. And that's a very important principle. Uh, uh, we've been talking about Matthew 28, 19, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. How do we understand that? The best way to understand that is let Scripture interpret Scripture. So how did the apostles understand it? 
How did they fulfill it in the book of Acts? Let's compare Matthew, Mark, and Luke together to see uh, if we can find uh, the answer. So you let Scripture give you light on Scripture. Instead of going to the creeds to interpret Scripture, or instead of going to outside writers to interpret Scripture, first of all, let Scripture interpret Scripture, and then you'll get a better understanding. Number seven, the Bible is unified, and its central focus is Jesus Christ. The Bible is written by about 40 authors over 1,500 years. And some of those authors were kings. Some of those authors were shepherds, farmers, fishermen. Uh, it spanned the spectrum of all kinds of human authors. But through it all, there is a consistent theme. And it's the plan of God's plan of salvation in Jesus Christ. You can see it in Genesis 3.15 which talks the first mention of the Savior, that the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. That's the first promise of the Savior to come. And you go all the way to the book of Revelation where Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. So the theme from start to finish is God's plan of salvation for the human race through Jesus Christ. So even though there's an amazing diversity, don't lose sight that the Bible is unified. And some people feel like the Bible contradicts itself, that one place has one theology, another place has another theology. But instead we understand that it's all woven together for a purpose, to bring us to an understanding of truth. And that truth is found in Jesus Christ. Number eight, truth has several witnesses. Now every verse of Scripture is important. We should not discount any verse of Scripture. But in trying to establish doctrine, we should realize God confirms His Word. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, Paul wrote, This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So if we're going to try to establish a, an important doctrine, we should be able to find several witnesses of truth. Now, understand me carefully. I'm not saying that we can ignore any one verse. I'm just saying if we're going to teach something, we should be able to build it on a good foundation. Uh, and if we can't do that, if we cannot find several witnesses of truth, we need to go back and double-check our interpretation because probably we are missing something somewhere. Because God does not leave himself without a witness. He has a way of underscoring and emphasizing and confirming truth. Um, a good example of this is what the Mormons do. The Mormons teach baptism for the dead. They will uh, baptize you for someone who's already dead, and they think that gives that person a chance to be saved uh, in, in the, uh, wherever they are. And they base this on 1 Corinthians 15, 29, where Paul made this statement that's the subject of much debate. He's trying to prove the resurrection. And he says, uh, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? And so the Mormons say, well, okay, on the basis of the scripture, we're going to baptize by proxy for dead people. Well, there is no other place in the Bible that even indicates such a thing. To the contrary, the rest of the Bible speaks about today is the day of salvation. It's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. So the rest of the Bible indicates that you must make your own decision in this life. Nobody else can do it for you. So the Mormons take this one verse and build a doctrine on it even though they cannot find any support. Well... I'm not questioning this verse. I'm questioning their interpretation. And so I'm saying their interpretation must be wrong because it doesn't match the rest of Scripture. If God wanted us to baptize for dead people, it would be stated clearly. We would have two or three examples in the book of Acts or, or several admonitions in the epistles telling us what to do. But since we don't have it, we must question some interpretation that would lead to this practice. And there are other interpretations 
he may be talking about a practice that some people are performing but not approving of it, or he may be talking about um, identifying with Christ's death. But the, his point in this passage is to, is to emphasize the, the resurrection. We won't get into that because I'm just trying to give you an example of how whenever you find a difficult interpretation, you look for other witnesses. And if you don't find it, then you say, wait a minute, I, must, I need to go back and look at that interpretation again. All right, number nine, each passage has one primary meaning but can have many applications. We're, what we're doing when we read the Scripture, don't try to put your meaning into the Scripture. Instead, try to bring what the Scripture is saying out of the Scripture. And once you understand its meaning, then you can apply it in many different situations. But you have to establish the meaning first before you can make the applications. And then finally, number 10, we should use sound rules of logic. Isaiah 118, God said, come and let us reason together. The Lord does want us to use our brains. Brother Tenney in America says God can use baptized brains. You don't have to be ignorant in order to be spiritual or to understand God's word. But he expects us to be diligent. And some people try to reason uh, improperly. Um, and they use arguments that are not relevant. And uh, maybe an appeal to something emotional. And, but we have to stop and say, wait a minute, God is a God of reason. And when he, he gave us his word so that we would study it and understand it. So we've got to go by his word. God's reasoning may transcend ours, but he's never illogical. And if he says there's one God, he's not going to come along and say, but there's another God. That would be contradictory, self-contradictory. And the Bible is not going to be self-contradictory. It's going to follow the basic rules of logic. The, of, of reasoning, the way we think. Now, if you would try to argue against this point, I would say, give me your argument. If we shouldn't use logic to study the Scriptures, okay, give me your argument. But to give me your argument, you would have to use a logical argument. So you would defeat your own, your own attempt uh, because we can't do it any other way. All right. Now, those are some basic rules that if you think carefully about it, I think most people can see the validity of these points. But still, sometimes we will approach Scripture as apostolic Pentecostals. We will read Acts chapter 2. And maybe a Catholic or a Baptist will read Acts chapter 2. And they will come up with different conclusions. So what I'm going to do next for a few minutes is talk about our apostolic Pentecostal distinctives. And I'm going to give you... How many do you have here? Five? Six. Okay. There are six um, distinctives that I think help define us as apostolic Pentecostals. And I want to talk about them for a few minutes because I believe this is how we can demonstrate a proper approach to Scripture will lead to the apostolic doctrine. And so let me talk about this for a minute. The first thing that we emphasize that other groups do not is apostolic authority. Now, what I, what I mean by that, we believe the apostles are the best ones to interpret Scripture. And so if we can prove that the apostles followed a certain practice, then we must follow the same practice. If we can prove that the apostles taught a certain doctrine, then we must teach that same doctrine. Actually, most Christian, Christian groups do not follow this principle. And I'll, I'll give you an example here in a moment. But why should we follow the apostles' authority so much? Well, because Jesus commissioned them. Now, I'm not going to take the time to give you all the Scripture, but Jesus did not write any of the New Testament. He commissioned it to the apostles and their associates. He prayed in John 17, um, he prayed for the apostles, and he said, I, he, he said, I also pray not for these only, but for all who will believe through their word. 
And so, and Jesus said in various places, if you, if those who reject you, they reject me. Those who accept you, they accept me. Uh, so he expected that people would follow the teaching of the apostles. He commissioned the apostles to go and make disciples of all nations, to baptize them, to teach them everything that he had commanded. And so he gave the apostles the authority to teach doctrine and preach the gospel. And we've got to follow their teaching and preaching. In fact, you find the early church did that in Acts chapter 2 and verse uh, 42. After people were added to the church on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2.42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. So one of the distinctives of apostolic Pentecostal interpretation is we follow the apostles' authority. Now, other denominations, what they do is they follow the creeds of the 4th and 5th centuries. They follow the writers of the 4th and 5th centuries. And you'll even find them making statements such as the early writers did not have a developed theology, but the later writers had a more developed theology. So we must follow the later writers. But the earliest writers were the apostles. And they were taught personally by Jesus. They were commissioned by Jesus. They were given the Holy Spirit to lead them and guide them into all truth. And so we must follow them. A good example is water baptism in Jesus' name. The apostolic church practiced baptism in Jesus' name. I, did a, I gave a paper several years ago at a group uh, of this, what's called the Society for Pentecostal Studies. And it includes Assemblies of God, Church of God, Charismatic, Catholic, Charismatic, all kinds of groups. And the discussion was over baptism in Jesus' name. And I went through the book of Acts and I showed from the Greek text that the apostles called the name of Jesus when they baptized. Well, at the end of my paper, I was expecting some of these scholars to get up and say, no, you're wrong, they, that's not what the Greek means, they didn't really call the name of Jesus, they did something else. But at the end of my paper, everybody agreed. They said, you're right. You have proved that the apostles called on the name of Jesus at water baptism. However, they said there's been doctrinal development. And maybe Matthew 28, 19 is a later development. And so maybe the church needs to have different ways of baptizing, depending on your doctrinal development. And I said, well, this is the difference between apostolic Pentecostals and the rest of you. For us, if we can prove what the apostles did, that is the end of the discussion. But for you, once we prove what the apostles did, that's just the beginning of the discussion. <laughs> they did that, but what should we do? And it's really interesting if you study this out, and I, I have it in some of my books, but a, a good example, Martin Luther, who is the founder of the Protestant Reformation, he heard of some people who baptized in Jesus' name. And uh, there was a, a, apparently among some of his followers, there was a controversy. And so he wrote in one of his books, we should not forbid these people from baptizing in Jesus' name. The reason is that's what the apostles did. So how can we forbid them when they're just doing what the apostles did? But he did not go on to say, we should also do it. He retained the Trinitarian formula. Ulrich Zwingli, he was a reform leader in Switzerland. And so he was the leader before John Calvin. He and Calvin would, have, would be the founders of the reformed movement, the Presbyterians and so on. He wrote in his works, Matthew 28, 19 was never meant to be a formula for baptism. He says, how do I know? Because in the Acts of the Apostles, the Apostles did not use it. So if it was intended to be a, a formula, why didn't they use it? Then he went on to say, he said, the theologians have made the biggest mistake of their lives in saying this should be the formula. But then he went on to say, I'm not saying you can't use it. I'm just saying that Jesus did not intend it to be a formula. Well, he realized that the apostles baptized in Jesus' name, but he did not start baptizing in Jesus' name. In the 20th century, Karl Barth, if you've ever studied uh, 
20th century theology. Karl Barth is probably the most famous Protestant theologian. You read in his works, he said, if you, if you had to go by Scripture, the only baptismal formula that would be absolutely necessary would be calling on the name of Jesus. And he explains that Matthew 20, 19, in his opinion, is an expansion of the Jesus name formula. But he said, in the interest of ecumenical unity, we should use the expanded formula, even though we cannot prove that it's necessary from Scripture. So in other words, because everybody else is doing it, we need to do it. So I'm giving you examples of famous theologians that they saw what the apostles did and they decided, well, we need to do something different for our own reasons. Well, that's not apostolic interpretation. Apostolic interpretation is once you establish that the apostles did this and establish this as a practice for us to follow, then that settles it. That's what we've got to do. So we need to go back to the authority of the apostles. Second thing that is distinctive about us is we look at the Old Testament foundation and the New Testament fulfillment. Now, I covered this somewhat when I was talking about the oneness of God. And I've already said that God reveals truth progressively from Old Testament to New Testament. But we look at the Old Testament as giving us the building blocks or the basics or the foundation, and we build on that. For example, our definition of God, where are we going to get it? Everybody has a definition of God, whether you like it or not. When you read in the New Testament about God, when you read Jesus as Lord and God, you have some concept of what Lord means and what God means. So the only question is, where did you get that concept from? And the sad thing is, many Christian groups get that concept from Greek philosophy. They get that concept from the creeds. But instead, I'm saying we should get that basic concept from the Old Testament and use that as our foundation to understand the New Testament. And the reason is that's how God revealed truth. He revealed it step by step, starting with the Old Testament. We need to understand it the same way. All right? Number three, focus on the revelation of the one God in Jesus Christ. We interpret everything on the basis of one, the one God has been revealed in Jesus Christ. Colossians 2, 9, For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So we're not going to accept any idea that contradicts the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. That's going to be our foundation. Number four, the importance of spiritual illumination and spiritual experience. Now, I want to be careful here. Experience cannot change the Word of God, but experience helps us to understand the Word of God. You know, if you're going to read uh, a cookbook, how are you going to understand that cookbook? You, you could read about the recipes. Well, add this, add that, add this, add that. But if you're going to just read the whole book, you're not going to have a very good understanding. If you really want to understand it, what do you do? You follow the recipe and you bake the cake or you make the food. Then you understand what it means. So there are a lot of things you cannot fully understand until you put it into practice. And that's true of God's Word. When you put it into practice, you start understanding it. A good example is um, the spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through chapter 14. When you read some commentaries about, by people who've never received the Holy Spirit, they've never spoken in tongues, they've never seen the spiritual gifts in operation, they don't have a very good understanding of this at all. They will say, speaking in tongues is the ability to learn foreign languages very easily. And they will say, prophecy is the ability to speak fluently. And they will say, um, the gifts of healing is the ability to learn medicine and study medicine and be effective in helping people. Well, they use those explanations because they've never seen the supernatural gifts. But those of us who've seen the gifts of the Spirit in operation, we can very easily understand what it means because we've seen it. We've experienced it. We know what it is. Now, we must be careful. We cannot take our personal experiences and try to add to God's Word. We must interpret our experiences by God's Word. You might have a valid experience, but you have to go to the Bible to understand what it means. But there is an interaction there. 
you study God's word and you see something and you try to put it into practice. And through, through that experience, you learn more about it. The Pentecostal movement started in 1901 by people who studied the book of Acts. And they said in the book of Acts, they received the Holy Spirit and the sign was tongues. We haven't received that, so we're going to pray until we receive that. So notice, they did not start with experience. They started with the Word of God. And the Word of God corrected their experience. The Word of God changed their experience. Well, they started receiving the Holy Spirit. They started speaking in tongues. So the Word of God was their authority over their experience. However, some of those early people, when they received the Holy Spirit, and they spoke in tongues, they thought, well, we're going to go be missionaries. So some of them actually went to China and India and they thought they would go in the street corner and start speaking in tongues and everybody would understand them. It didn't happen. So they learned that just because you can speak in tongues does not mean that you're necessarily going to speak in a certain language of a certain country and you can become a missionary without studying the language. So by experience, they learn what tongues would and would not do. Okay? So they went back to the Bible and read it again. And the Bible doesn't say that if you speak in tongues, you can be a missionary and speak in the languages. It doesn't say that. So they, that experience helped them to understand the gift of tongues more accurately. But how do you learn those kind of things unless you put it into practice? So we believe that spiritual illumination and spiritual experience is important. Now, number five, what do I have for number five? My notes are... Yes, interpretation in light of the end time. We need to understand the times in which we live. We are living scripturally in the last days. In the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Acts chapter 2. We are living in the last days. We are living in the fulfillment of prophecy. We don't, do not know when the Lord will come, but we know his coming is, is soon. And actually from the day of Pentecost on, we've been living in the last days. And the coming of the Lord is getting closer and closer. So in everything we do, we are interpreting in light of the coming of the Lord. And we apply it in that, in that way. In fact, the early Pentecost movement began because people were expecting the Lord to come back. So they started praying, Lord, restore your church to the fullness of power. And that's when they started studying the book of Acts. And they realized, well, where is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Where is speaking in tongues? Where is miracles? Where, where is healing? Because the Lord's coming back. We believe there was a former reign, but we also believe there will be a latter reign where God will pour out His Spirit up on all flesh. But they're saying, where, where is this happening in the churches, in the denominations? It's not happening. And so they begin to pray, Lord, we feel that Your coming is drawing close. We want a restoration of the apostolic church. And that's how the Pentecostal movement began in the 20th century was this belief in the end time. And then number six, finally, um, presumption of relevance and applicability. In other words, when we read the Bible, we assume that it is relevant to us, it will apply to us. Now, we understand there are many things in the Old Testament that were written for Israel, and there many things were types and shadows, as, as I've already described, that point us to Christ. But the moral teachings of the Old Testament still apply. If something was a ceremonial law, we know that it points to Christ. It's fulfilled in Him, like the dietary laws, like the Sabbath keeping, and so forth. But if something is a moral law, we know that God's moral nature never changes. And what He hates in the Old Testament times, He hates in New Testament times. What He likes in Old Testament times, He likes in New Testament times. So the Old Testament, we look for its relevance and its application to us. The New Testament, we know we are living in New Testament times. So we will assume that the New Testament teachings will apply directly to us. Now that's different from most groups. When you go to 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul wrote that it's a shame for a man to have long hair, but it's a glory for a woman to have long hair. Doesn't even nature itself teach you that a man ought not to have long hair, but a woman ought to have long hair for his hair is given to her for a covering. Now, what do most Christian groups do with that? They say, oh, that doesn't apply today. That's just the culture of the first century. But what do we do with that? We say, if it's in the Bible, 
and particularly in the New Testament, we assume it's for us. And if you actually read that passage, to argue that it was just a cultural issue is, is plainly false because Paul did not appeal to culture. He said, doesn't even nature teach you? And he goes back to creation. God created them male and female. He created the man first and then the woman, and, and they both need each other. So he appealed to God's original created, creative order. He appealed to nature. And he said, if anyone wants to be contentious about this, we don't have any other custom, neither the churches of God. So he wasn't appealing just to Corinth. He was saying the churches of God. At that time, there were Jewish churches. There were Gentile churches. There were churches in Rome. There were churches in, in the Middle East. There were churches in Greece. And he was saying none of the churches of God have any other practice. We all agree. Among, across the cultures, we all agree. So to argue that that's an outmoded cultural statement is to misunderstand the very passage. So you see many groups, when they come, they come to 1 Timothy 2 which we talked about last night. And they said, oh, that doesn't, that doesn't apply because that was just the first century culture. But wait a minute. The Bible is not just given to one culture. It's given to all of us. And uh, if you're going to, once you start arguing that way, then you get to the next step, which, of course, um, the Church of England and uh, the Episcopalian Church is having a big fight over right now is in Romans chapter 1, Paul said homosexuality is against nature. And so therefore, um, it's wrong. But what are they saying nowadays? Oh, well, that was just the first century culture. That was just Paul's opinion. But times have changed. The culture have changed. Our society now accepts and encourages homosexuality, so we should do the same. But God's Word stays the same. So apostolic interpretation says we presume that everything in the Word of God is for our benefit, and especially the things written to the New Testament church after the day of Pentecost, the instructions to the New Testament church. We are the New Testament church, so we must apply these teachings to our lives. It would be a good question. Is there anything written to the New Testament church that, that we don't follow? And if there is, should we follow? Should we follow it? Now, I've tried to think about this, and I've asked people this question. And they have found one passage that we don't always follow. It says, greet one another with a holy kiss. <laughs> but even that, I think you can see what's happening there. It's not in the teaching portions of the epistles. But Paul will write, like in uh, Romans, you know, greet so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, greet this person and that person in the church that's in their house. And he says, greet one another with a holy kiss. So he's in the, the uh, closing portions, the greeting portions of his letter. Well, we don't go around looking for Olympus and Nereus and, and greet them because we know that was given a specific command to those specific individuals. And I think what we can see there as well um, when it says greet with a holy kiss, he's talking about those people, that church, and of course that was the culturally appropriate way in the Middle East and even today. You'll find they'll greet, kiss you on one cheek or the air in front of your cheek and they'll kiss you on the other cheek. And that's the way they do it. But that's a good question to ask. Is there anything in the New Testament that, uh, written to the New Testament church that we don't apply? And if there is, why not? Why don't we apply it? Should we? And we apostolics are saying we need to apply everything that we can. And those six principles help define how we're different from other groups. Now, let me just briefly run through a few things. Applying the grammatical historical method. Now, let, let's... Let's make it practical. If you come to a certain passage of Scripture, how can you put this into practice? And I've just given you ten things to look at. Not every one of them will be um, relevant in the same degree every time. But these are ten things to look at whenever you're studying a passage of Scripture. And I'll give you some examples. Perhaps we can look at the example of Matthew 28, 19, which we talked about briefly before but it will help you to, to put this in perspective. So the first thing, you look at biblical history. A study of biblical history can help you understand certain passages, particularly certain ancient prophecies. For example, the study of Daniel, the book of Daniel, 
You, you remember the image, the head of gold and, and uh, the, the chest of silver and, and so on and so forth. How do you understand that? Well, when you study history, you know, there was the Babylonian Empire, then the Persian Empire, then the Greek Empire, then the Roman Empire. And you can see how that fits. But if you don't know your history, you won't be able to understand. You have to know the history at the time the books were written. Second thing is biblical geography. If you understand the biblical geography, that can help you appreciate passages of Scripture. For instance, it's very interesting to know in Palestine at the time of Christ, in the north was Galilee, in the center was Samaria, in the south was Judea. Well, in John chapter 4, Jesus and his disciples were traveling from Judea back to Galilee. And the Bible says Jesus must needs go through Samaria. Well, the fastest route would be to go through Samaria. However, there was one problem. The Jews hated the Samaritans. They considered them to be compromisers. So normally they would detour around Samaria. But Jesus insisted on going through Samaria. And so you get a little bit by studying the geography and the culture, which I mentioned next, you see the significance of why he wanted to go through Samaria and meet the Samaritan woman. Biblical culture is, is also important. We, we learn to appreciate certain things when we understand the cultural setting. The story of the prodigal son, you know it well. The prodigal was returning home, and his father ran out to meet him. You remember that part of the story? If you've never studied it, it actually says when the son was a long way off, his father ran out to meet him. Now, when you study the Oriental culture and the Middle Eastern culture, the father had, had a lot of dignity. He was like the patriarch of the family. So he wouldn't just go, and, and he wore these long robes. This son had been disowned from the family because of his own choice. And so you would not think of the father trying to run out to be reconciled to the son. But you would think of the son coming and humbly bowing to the father and just like the son was thinking, well, maybe I could at least be a servant. I don't even expect to be a son again, but I'll just come and humble myself and be a servant. And you can imagine all the neighbors, they know the whole story. And for this man to see his son way far off, and so he would tuck up his robe and start running down the dirt path. And his long white beard and all the neighbors are looking at him. You're, you're the patriarch. You're the elder. You're supposed to be sitting there letting the son come crawl back to you. But instead, you're running way out down the dusty road in the sight of everyone. You have thrown away your dignity. You've thrown away your status. You've lost face in your community. But he didn't care because he loved his son. You see, when you study the culture... That makes it much more meaningful. And from a oneness point of view, here's the father in the parable. And here's the sinner. But where does Jesus fit in? Well, I'll show you where Jesus fits in. The father humbled himself and ran out on the dusty road. There you have Jesus. The father is Jesus is the father coming in the flesh, running down the road to meet the lost sinner. So the culture gives you the appreciation of what's really going on. Okay, number four, the setting. And by that I mean the immediate background or the situation. Uh, one example is the baptism of Christ, which I used the first night. When you look at it through the eyes of the people that were there on that scene, they didn't see it as a revelation of the Trinity, so why should we? Uh, Matthew twenty-eight nineteen. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Don't read it from our perspective. Read it from the apostles' perspective. They had just been taught in John 14. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How can you ask? Show us the Father. I and my Father are one. The Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. You know, another Comforter will come, but you already know Him. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So they already had an explanation of Father, Son, and Spirit. So read it from the, the situation of that time and you'll have a better understanding. So much depends on the situation. Let me give you a, a non-biblical example. 
A little phrase, if I would say to you, the door is open. That seems to be a very easy sentence that everybody can understand. There's no mistake. But it all depends on the situation as to what it really means. Let's say I'm the professor and I'm sitting in my office, I'm writing, I'm very busy, and you're a young student and you're standing outside my door and you want to come talk to me but you don't want to disturb me. You're very nervous. And I look up and I see you there and I say, the door is open. What does that mean? Come in. It's not just this door is open. It's saying, come in. Okay, what if you come in and we start talking and then you say, but you're wrong. And then you get loud and say, but that's not fair. That's not right. And I look up at you and I say, the door is open. <laughs> what does that mean? Leave. That's just the opposite. In the early example, the door is open means come in. In the next example, the door is open means leave. It means just the opposite. That's the, that's the situation. That's the setting. So you have to understand who's speaking. I'll give you another example. John chapter 9. It says, we know that God does not hear the prayer of sinners. That's in the Bible. Is that a true statement? That's a true statement? God doesn't hear the prayer of sinners? How did you repent? Were you a sinner when you repented? God heard your prayer. But the Bible says God does not hear the prayer of sinners. What's the setting? Do you know the story in which that is said? The blind man who was healed? He didn't know who Jesus was, but Jesus healed him. And then he was called by the religious authorities and said, Who healed you? And he says, Well, I don't know who he was, but, but this man came and he healed me. And he says, I know one thing. Once I was blind, now I see. And they say, well, that Jesus that healed you, uh, you know, re reject him. He's a sinner. And he says, well, I don't know whether he's a sinner or not, but I know I was healed. And so they said to him, well, you know, you, you, need, to, you need to curse him. You need to renounce him. He, he's a sinner. And he says, well, you mean you don't understand this? God wouldn't hear a sinner's prayer. But... If uh, he did this miracle. But so the blind man was not really speaking uh, from a position of theological authority. That was his statement. That was his opinion. Now, maybe you can interpret it to say that, that God will not answer a, a prayer of healing or something for a sinner unless he's repentant. But even there, I'm not so sure that's true. I believe sometimes... Sinners pray and God does hear their prayer. But if you understand the setting, it's not a problem because Jesus, it wasn't what Jesus said. It wasn't what the apostles said. It was what this blind man, formerly blind man, was saying in conversation to the religious authorities. So when you put it in the context, or I'll give you even another one. The Bible says, if you eat of this fruit, you shall be as God. Is that true? The devil was the one that said that. Now, the fact that he said it is true, but is that statement true? You see, you have to look at the context. Who's speaking before you, before you agree to a certain statement? Who's speaking? The importance of the setting. Number five, the importance of the literary mold or the genre. In other words, uh, what type of book, what type of writing is it in? Um, is it in a parable? You will interpret that differently then it's a historical book. A parable is an imaginary story. That's, it's a true-to-life story that's told to emphasize a certain point, but it's not a historical story. Um, if you read something in, uh, say, a, a prophetic book, it's got a lot more symbolism than a historical book. So if I read, if I tell you that in a certain book, a lion rose, at, rose up, well, if it's in the book of Revelation, you're thinking it's probably symbolic line. But if you read it in Judges, it's probably a literal animal. So it depends on the book. You have to understand the different styles of writing. If it's a, a book of poetry, there's a lot of figurative expression. If it's in the Proverbs, the wisdom literature, that's, those are our um, uh, wisdom statements, are generally true statements. They express uh, principles to live by. 
Uh, it says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's a general principle. Does that mean if you're raised in a Christian home, there's no way you can backslide? That you're going to go to heaven no matter what? No. It means it's a general principle that if you train up your child in the right way, he's going to have right values. But still, he's going to have to make his own personal decision. But if you understand that's wisdom literature, that's a proverbial expression. So understanding the, the literary mold is important. Number six, understanding special literary forms, such as figures of speech and parables. I, I mentioned that. Um, there are all kinds of figures of speech that are used in the Bible, and we need to learn to identify that. Uh, I'll give you an example of irony. Irony is when the words you say have actually the opposite meaning. Um, you remember the story of Isaiah and the prophets of Baal? And the prophets of Baal were praying for Baal to answer, and there was no answer. And Isaiah said, oh, well, pray louder. Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he's on a trip. Maybe he's busy. Now, did, did he really believe that? Did Isaiah, I mean, not Isaiah, Elijah, did he really believe that Baal was sleeping? No. He was making fun of them. It's an example of irony. So in the case of Elijah, you have to understand he was using irony, not, not um, you know, not just straightforward speech. So those special figures of speech are very important. The Bible says our God is a consuming fire. Does that mean we should become fire worshipers? No, it's a metaphor. It's saying there's some characteristics of God that are like fire. And you need to know that. Then the context, number seven, this is probably the most important of all. You look at the context and you will understand so much if you read a passage of Scripture in its context and not try to take it out of the setting in which it is used. We see that in uh, Matthew 28, 19, where Jesus is talking about his authority, his disciples, and his commandments, and he will be with them. The context indicates he's talking about his name, not the name of three different persons. So reading the surrounding passage of Scripture will help you understand things so much more clearly. Um, in Ezekiel chapter 37, it talks about a valley of dry bones. You remember that story and the bones start coming together and they're resurrected? Well, some people say that's teaching about the rapture of the church. But if you look in the context, it's talking about the restoration of Israel as a nation, that God is prophesying they will one day be restored. Then in that same chapter, it talks about two sticks being brought together and being joined as one. The Mormons teach that the two sticks are two scrolls. And one is the Bible and one is the Book of Mormon. But if you read the context, the names of those sticks are, is Israel and Judah. And it says those two nations that were divided are going to be joined and become one nation again. So it's talking about the restoration of Israel. The context makes it very clear what it's talking about. So a lot of times, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but somebody will come up to you and they'll read one verse and say, what does that mean? Or, or this verse means such and such. And you think, oh, no, I didn't know that was in the Bible. I didn't know the Bible teaches this false doctrine. You know? But if you'll just slow down and carefully say, okay, you know, be very wise and say, all right, let's look at this. And let's start from the beginning of the chapter and let's read the whole chapter. And then usually by the time you're finished reading, you know the answer. So you can appear to be very wise to them. Because <laughs> you study the context. Okay. Number eight, the word meetings, the study of words. Uh, a good example is in Acts 10, Cornelius' household was saved. Household in the Greek is oikos. Now, in modern Western culture, we think of a household as father, mother, and two kids. But maybe in the Oriental culture, you would be more familiar with, and also in the Greek culture, the household was extended family. Grandparents, aunts and uncles, cousins, nieces and nephews, and household servants. So the people that were saved in Cornelius' household were all these family and friends and servants, which is a good model for evangelism today. But you learn it from the definition of the Greek word oikos. It does not mean just the nuclear family, immediate family. It means extended family. 
And, and you see that when you study the words. The grammar, uh, there are certain passages where the grammar comes out very clearly. Matthew 28, 19, in the name, singular, of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That grammar is important. Um, Jesus used this in Matthew 22, 32. They were asking him about the resurrection. And he says, don't you remember where God said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? He said that to Moses hundreds of years later after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were already dead. But God is not the God of the dead. God is the God of the living. So all live unto him. The resurrection is a reality because in God's plan, all are alive to him. So he used that present tense to make an important doctrinal point. And so sometimes the grammar is significant. And then the harmony of Scripture, and that is... We, we seek, when we're trying to interpret a particular passage, we try to interpret it in a way that's consistent with our interpretation of other passages, parallel passages. And we, again, we do this with Matthew 28, 19. We try to understand Matthew in light of Acts, and we try to understand Acts in light of Matthew, and we try to understand Matthew in light of Mark and Luke. We match them all up and see what explanation is consistent with all the different accounts. So if you'll follow these ten, um, these ten points, it will help you in any particular passage if you carefully work your way through it to come out up with the meaning that God intended for us to understand as opposed to just your personal opinion or somebody else's personal opinion. Now, the things that I've talked about tonight probably not as exciting um, as maybe some of the other things. But if you'll take a little time to think about them, they'll be a great help to you in your own personal study. It gives you a method so that you're not just reading and say, what do I think this means? John, what do you think this means? Well, I think it means this. Well, I think it means this. Well, I feel that it means this. Well, everybody has their own feelings. But nobody knows what it means. So if you work this plan out, it shows you how to study and you can come to the same conclusion. Or if you're studying this with maybe some friend that doesn't understand the Holy Ghost, for example, you can use some of these examples. And you can say, well, would you agree we need to follow the, the apostles' authority? Wouldn't that be better authority than anybody else, even Jerome and Augustine and, and all these guys? Wouldn't it be better to follow Peter and Paul? And if they say yes, you say, okay, let's go follow them. What do they say about it? See if you can get them to agree on some principles that you know which direction it's going to lead. Once they agree on those principles, then you can help guide them into a more correct understanding of Scripture. So I hope that these things will help you in your own personal study.